Razer have a new 16 inch Blade gaming laptop with a bigger 16 inch screen and more power compared to the 15 inch model. But there are some major issues that you need to know about. The Blade 16 has a solid CNC aluminum unibody chassis with an anodized matte black finish, just like they've done for years now, and it feels excellent. There's almost no flex to the keyboard and lid. The metal build quality feels very sturdy during normal use. There's a long groove on the front to help with opening, but it could be bigger as I sometimes miss it unless I use a fingernail. One finger opening wasn't a problem and the hinge feels extremely nice and smooth to open and close. It's just as wide as the Blade 15 but it's a little deeper to fit the taller 16 inch screen and it's noticeably thicker too but that gives us more thermal headroom for better performance. Despite being thicker it still does not have room for an ethernet port but we can solve that with the USB-C 9-in-1 docking station for from Ugreen, who have sponsored this part of the video. The Ugreen USB-C 9-in-1 docking station does exactly what it says. It lets us expand with 9 extra ports simply by connecting the included Type-C cable to your laptop. The front has two USB-A and a USB-C port, all 3.2 Gen 2 for 10 gigabit per second high speed data transfer and less waiting time. The other side has a gigabit ethernet port as well as two DisplayPort and two HDMI HDMI ports. This allows you to connect two 4K monitors at 60Hz in Windows or Mac OS, in mirror or extended modes to increase your productivity. The whole dock works fine from your laptop's battery power, but if you connect the rear USB-C port to a wall outlet, it can charge your laptop with up to 100 watts. Check out the Ugreen USB-C 9-in-1 docking station with the link below the video. Back to the Blade 16. The laptop alone weighs just over 2.5 kilos or 5.5 pounds, increasing to almost 3.5 kilos or 7.6 pounds with the 330 watt power brick included. It's a GAN charger, so it's noticeably more compact compared to other brands, especially MSI. Mine has Intel's Core i9-13950HX processor, Nvidia's RTX 4090 graphics, 32 gigs of memory, and a new 16 inch dual resolution mini LED screen. There's a 1080p camera above the screen in the middle with a privacy shutter, and it has IR for Windows Hello Face Unlock. Here's how the camera and microphones look and sound, and this is what it sounds like while typing on the keyboard. The keyboard has customizable per key RGB backlighting, and all keys and secondary functions get lit up. Keyboard brightness gets fairly bright and can be adjusted between 15 different levels with the F10 and F11 shortcut keys. There's plenty more customization available through the Razer Synapse software, and you can also change the effect of the green Razer logo on the lid between static, breathing, or off. The power button is right next to delete and backspace. A quick accidental press doesn't do anything, but it will go to sleep if you hold it for just a little longer. Typing on the keyboard was fine and worked well, but I personally prefer something with more of a tactile feel. The glass touchpad feels smooth and works well. It's massive, but it didn't get in the way of typing for me. There are front facing speakers on either side of the keyboard and underneath. Two tweeters and two subs all up. They sound pretty good. There's some bass and they're still pretty clear at higher volumes. Though like the Blade 18, personally I thought it sounded better if you disable THX spatial audio, which was on by default. The latency mon results were quite bad in this one. We ran our normal 5 minute test 3 times, but same results. The left side has the power input at the back, 2 USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A ports, a 3.2 Gen 2 Type C port, and 3.5mm audio combo jack. The right has a UHS-2 SD card slot, Thunderbolt 4 Type C port, a third USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A port, HDMI 2.1 output, and Kensington lock right at the back. There aren't any ports at all on the back. The power cable can go in two ways. One covers the USB ports, so I guess don't do that if you need them. Both Type-C ports can be used to charge the laptop with up to 100 watts, and they both have support for DisplayPort 1.4, connecting directly to the Nvidia graphics whether Optimus is on or off. HDMI also connects directly to the Nvidia graphics, and we confirmed it can run a 4K screen at 120Hz 12-bit with G-Sync. Getting inside requires unscrewing 8 TR5 screws, all the same length. 
I was able to slide the panel to the front and off without tools, but the screw type is still uncommon. I'll leave a link to the tools I use below the video. Once inside, we've got the battery down the front, two memory slots in the middle, two PCIe Gen 4 M.2 storage slots on top of each other on the left, and Wi-Fi 6E card on the right. Neither M.2 slot can fit a double-sided SSD with chips on both sides. There's just no room due to this stacked up design. The speeds from both of the one terabyte SSDs that mine came with were excellent, and the SD card was decent too, but not quite maxing out my V90 card. The card clicks in and sits most of the way into the machine. The Wi-Fi speed wasn't as good as last year's blades, or this year's larger Blade 18 with the same Wi-Fi card, but it's still a decent result. The upgradability score was on the lower side for a 16 inch laptop. I take off half a point for the uncommon screw type to get inside, and half a point for each M.2 slot that can't do dual sided SSDs. Otherwise we still at least have two M.2 slots, two RAM slots, and swappable Wi-Fi. The Blade 16 is powered by a 95.2 watt hour battery, which is actually a little larger than the one in the Blade 18, as that has a third fan in the middle. The Synapse software will force the balanced performance mode when running on battery power, you can't change it. You've also got the option of having the lighting effects behave differently or turn off on battery to save power. Razer has also added the option to lower the screen's refresh rate down to 60Hz when you unplug the charger. It's not on by default, but I've tested with it enabled. The screen flashes black as the refresh rate changes if Optimus is off. But with Optimus on, it didn't need to do that. I found this a bit buggy though. Sometimes the refresh rate didn't change when unplugging. Other times it didn't change when plugging back in. Razer are also giving us the option to limit the maximum charge level between 50 and 80%. Again, it's not enabled by default, but this will be a nice feature, which should help improve the lifespan of the battery. The battery still has a two year warranty this year, if you're concerned about battery bloat issues in older models. It lasted for just over seven hours in my YouTube video playback test, which is 55% longer compared to the bigger Blade 18 with a slightly smaller battery. It's a great result for an Intel gaming laptop, as the top of this graph is usually dominated by AMD Ryzen based laptops. Even Razer's own smaller Blade 14 with much smaller battery was lasting more more than an hour longer than the Blade 16, presumably due to the AMD CPU. Let's check out thermals next. We've got two fans with the CPU and GPU covered by a vapor chamber cooler. Razer are using thermal paste on both the CPU and GPU. No liquid metal here. There are holes in the bottom panel directly above the fans for intake, as well as some lower cutouts, and air only gets exhausted down and out the back. Razer's Synapse software allows us to change between different performance modes, which from lowest to highest are silent, balanced, and custom. For some reason, only balanced mode lets us customize the fan speed up or down with a slider. Custom mode otherwise lets us change between four levels for the CPU and three for the GPU. A few days after we got the laptop, there was an update that added a max fan button, but it only works with the CPU and GPU on the highest mode. We've also got the option of enabling CPU overclocking, which gives us the option to undervolt the processor or increase the maximum power limits and turbo boost time, similar to Intel XTU. Actually, just quickly while we're on the topic of Synapse, I had some really annoying problems with it. It was super frustrating. For whatever reason, after a week or so, it just completely stopped opening. Maybe with the right combination of reboots and restarting the Razer service, it might open one in every 20 times. It was ridiculous. I ended up completely uninstalling it and reinstalling it fresh, which did actually solve the problem, at least for a couple of days, because it came right back. So not sure what the problem is, but it seems like an update might be needed to fix that. I'm currently on my second full reinstall and it's been going okay for the last few days. I guess at least we're lucky that we're not having these issues that have been showing up on Reddit. The internal temperatures were fine when just sitting there idle. A bit warmer on the CPU, but not a problem. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU stress tests, which aim to represent a worst case full load scenario. Balanced mode was a 
a fair bit cooler if we set the fans to max speed. Temps were warmer in the higher modes, but not thermal throttling. There wasn't really a temperature difference with boost plus high between auto and max fans. The cooling pad I test with, linked below the video, didn't really help this laptop either. And running with the lid closed while docked was the warmest as cool air comes in through the keyboard. These are the clock speeds being reached during the same stress tests. Interestingly, setting the fans to max speed in balanced mode allowed the CPU performance to boost, but at the expense of lower GPU performance. CPU clock speeds were a little faster with the fans at max in boost plus high mode, but it's not much of a difference, and the cooling pad wasn't really any different because thermals aren't a limit. That said, performance dipped back a little with the lid closed as it was hottest like this. Best case, the CPU was running close to 60 watts while the GPU was around 136 watts. The GPU was actually running between 30 and 140. 136 was just the average over time. The 4090 can run up to the maximum 175 watts with dynamic boost, but with the CPU loaded up at the same time, the 4090 is a fair bit below this. Here's how an actual game performs with the different modes in use. I know this is an older game, but still, max settings at the native 3840 by 2400 resolution puts this higher than 4K, and it's still running fine. The CPU can boost much higher with the GPU idle, like in Cinebench. I've also tested with the overclock option enabled, with power sliders maxed out and a minus 0.05 volt undervolt applied, but it only gave a small 2% boost in multi-core. It starts off running at 160 watts, but thermal throttled down to 120 watts at 101 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, it's scoring more than a thousand points higher compared to the larger Blade 18 with the same CPU. Though, in terms of percent, the smaller Blade 16 is just 4% higher, which really isn't much at all. Still though, I would have expected the bigger Blade 18 to have better cooling and higher power limits. Performance lowers if we unplug the charger and instead run purely off of battery power. And although the multi-core performance was still close to the Blade 18, the single core score from the smaller Blade 16 was much better. But I'm not sure to what degree this depends on silicon lottery. Most laptops I test are in the low 30 degrees Celsius range on the keyboard at idle, and the Blade 16 was right in line with this. It's not much warmer with the stress test going, but it feels a little warm as the metal finish conducts heat. Balanced mode was much cooler with the fans maxed out instead of on auto. WASD was always cool as air went through the keyboard at the blue sections. It's not that much different to the touch in low, medium, high, or boost modes, but the fan noise is different. Let's have a listen. The fans could be completely silent at idle, but they would turn on from time to time, though were still quiet. They get louder in the higher performance modes, but there wasn't that much difference between the higher setting levels. Just before we get into the game testing, we need to check out this new 16 inch screen. It's 16 by 10, so more pixels vertically compared to the Blade 15 or 17, which also means less bottom chin and more viewable screen space. There's a QHD Plus 2560 by 1600. 240Hz option, or the dual UHD+, FHD+, mini LED screen with a thousand dimming zones, which mine has. This lets you run the screen at either 3840 by 2400 with a 120Hz refresh rate, or 1920 by 1200 with a 240Hz refresh rate. However, you need to reboot to swap between them. It's kind of cool, because normally with a 4K 120Hz screen, you'd be stuck with it. Normally, if you just set a 4K screen in Windows to a 1080p resolution, it'll still have the same maximum refresh rate, so 120Hz in this case. But now this way you can do 1080p 240Hz and get the benefit of that higher refresh rate. Now maybe I'm a bit lazy, but rebooting to swap doesn't seem worth it to me. I'd probably just keep it at 4K 120Hz and run games at 1080p 120Hz if I wanted the extra FPS boost, because this thing can certainly run modern games at 4K no problem. But that's just me and I don't play esports games. And hey, maybe one 
Monday like Advanced Optimus, it won't need the reboot. Average greater gray response time was measured at 5.6 milliseconds in the 4K 120Hz mode, and faster at 4.3 milliseconds in the 1080p 240Hz mode. Though I'm a little less confident in the accuracy of these results, as mini LED is difficult to measure due to PWM. It's not quite as good compared to this year's new Blade 18, but it's comparable to the Blade 15 and 17 from last gen in the faster 240Hz mode. The 4K 120Hz mode really wasn't that much slower though. So again, I can't see myself bothering with the reboot to swap. The total system latency is the amount of time between a mouse click and when a gunshot fire appears on the screen in CSGO. Despite the response time not being the best, the 240Hz mode allowed the Blade 16 to break the record and become the fastest result. Windows doesn't automatically adjust the scaling after you reboot to change the resolution. So when you change, you'll either end up with everything too small or too big. Another inconvenience. The Blade 16 has advanced Optimus, so you can change between integrated and discrete graphics without rebooting. If you want the traditional MUX switch, it's in the BIOS. It's also got G-Sync as long as Optimus is off. Otherwise Adaptive Sync is available from the Intel graphics with Optimus on. Color gamut was extremely good, but a few percentage points lower with HDR on. Contrast was perfect as the backlight switches off for black and the screen gets very bright. We're looking at over 900 nits at maximum with HDR enabled, but still above 600 without HDR. So not quite the advertised 1000 nits, but that may only be for shorter bursts rather than sustained, which I can't measure. There's no backlight bleed as it's mini LED. The zones turn off when showing black. In this example, the mouse cursor appears to be making three of the zones light up, which can result in a blooming or halo effect in some content. I can't say I really noticed it under normal conditions though. There were some serious problems with this screen that would have prevented me from recommending this laptop to anyone, but they recently fixed them with an update. The problem is, this update doesn't show if you go into Razer's Synapse software and select the check updates option. You have to go to their website and download it manually, so I'll leave a link to it below. Basically, there was an image retention problem, kind of like burn-in for OLED. In my examples, I clearly had the lines from Razer's wallpaper on the screen even when I was running a game, or even when I was booted into Linux to confirm that it wasn't a weird Windows graphical glitch. There was also this weird sort of blotchiness on the 1080p resolution, kind of like the darker backlight zones took longer to turn on or something. But again, those problems have been patched with the March 7 update. But that's almost a full month after this laptop launched and went on sale. So if you've already got this laptop, you'll definitely want to install that update. And if you plan on buying it, well, chances are that they're probably not going to update all of the ones that are already on shelves in stores. So yeah, be aware of this. This same update also apparently fixes the flicker issue I reported in my Blade 18 review. It's great that we've got fixes, but these are some pretty serious issues that slipped through QA. Alright, now let's find out how well Razer's Blade 16 performs in games and see how it compares against other laptops. Laptops. Cyberpunk 2077 was tested the same on all laptops, and I've got the Blade 16 shown by the red highlight. Despite having RTX 4090 graphics, the 4080 in the larger Blade 18 was about 10 FPS faster at 1080p, possibly due to the GPU power of the Blade 16 dipping to 130 watts at times with the CPU under load. Interestingly, both the Blade 16 and 18 had more dips in performance compared to the other machines near them, as shown by the 1% low. The 1% lows from the Blade 16 and 18 were still close together at the higher 1440p resolution. However, it seems that the higher tier RTX 4090 GPU is able to start stretching its legs here, as the Blade 16 was 6% faster than the bigger Blade 18. Not really much of a difference in this game going from 4080 to 4090, but both of those could also reach much higher frame rates if you also made use of frame generation. Red Dead Redemption 2 was 
tested with the game's benchmark. And the Blade 16 was even worse at 1080p in this one. I mean, it's not bad, but we've got a last gen laptop beating it. That said, it's still 18% faster than last year's Blade 15, which is only a bit smaller. And it's about 9% faster than last year's larger Blade 17 with maxed out GPU. Again, it's a little different at 1440p, implying that once we start getting more GPU bound and shift work away from the processor, the 4090 starts doing better. Though it's still slightly behind the lower tier 4080 in the larger Blade 18. Control is quite GPU heavy, even at the lower 1080p resolution. At least it's ahead of the Blade 18 with 4080 this time, and not far off the only other 4090 laptop I've got data for so far, Asus's Scar 18. But check out the 1% low difference. The Blade 16 was much lower than the others, though we didn't have any obvious stuttering when playing. It's actually the best result in terms of average FPS at the higher 1440p resolution. But again, the 1% low isn't as good as the SCAR 18 just below it. At least the 1% low isn't much different to last gen laptops here. It was further behind at 1080p. Here are the 3D Mark results for those that find them useful. Now for some content creator tests. Adobe Premiere was tested with the Puget Systems benchmark tool, and the score is good, but not quite as good as the larger Blade 18. And within margin of error range to the best result from last gen. Adobe Photoshop generally likes single threaded performance, and although the Blade 16 did well here in Cinebench, thanks to its 13th gen i9 processor, it's beaten by a few 12th gen models from last year here. GPU power usually matters more in DaVinci Resolve, and the 4090 in the Blade 16 was only beaten by the 4090 in the SCAR 18. But again, like some of the games, the 4080 in the bigger Blade 18 was close. Blender is entirely dependent on the GPU, so the 4090 in the Blade 16 is able to score 28% higher than the 4080 in the Blade 18. We've also tested SpecViewPerf, which tests out various professional 3D workloads. The BIOS looks ancient, but it's still functional, though there aren't a whole lot of unique customizations to make through here anyway. Just the usual basic stuff that you'd expect to see, or settings like battery health or resolution change, which you can change through software in Windows. Linux support was tested with an Ubuntu 22.10 Live CD. By default, the keyboard, touchpad, camera, and Wi-Fi worked but the speakers did not. The keyboard shortcuts to adjust screen and keyboard brightness worked too, but the RGB effect was the default spectrum cycling and could not be changed. Let's discuss pricing and availability next. This will change over time, so refer to the link below the video for updates and sales. And speaking of sales, check out my website gaminglaptop.deals to get the best deal on your next gaming laptop. We update it daily to include the latest deals, and we'll be sure to add the Blade 16 if it ever goes on sale. At the time of recording one month after launch, Razer's Blade 16 starts from $2600 US dollars for the RTX 4060 configuration, while the maxed out 4090 that I've got is $4300, with a number of other options in between. So not cheap, which should come as no surprise from Razer, but is it worth paying? I suppose it depends on how much you want a stealthy all black metal gaming laptop that can still pack a punch while not being too large. Razer still has the slightly smaller Blade 15 if portability is a priority, and the Blade 14 should return later this year too. My biggest problem with this laptop was the software experience, which I would summarize as frustrating, but in theory that will improve over time with updates. The screen problems were really bad, so I'm glad that Razer were able to get that update out that fixed all the problems. But at the same time, it raises QA concerns, given this laptop has been out for a month now. There were some welcome software updates though, like a max fan option in custom mode, battery charge level, and CPU tuning options. Battery life was impressive from an Intel based machine, CPU performance was quite good relative to the bigger Blade 18, and the screen looked great after that bug fix update. Check out this video before you consider buying an RTX 49 laptop like this one. I've compared the 4090 with the best from last gen, the 3080 Ti. Maybe you can save some money getting a last gen model, they still perform quite well. But spoiler, the 4090 does actually offer quite a nice boost. So I'll see you in that one.